Hello, welcome back to another explanation video on the no input mixing board. It's been a couple of months since the last one of these uh, longer, more formal explanations that I've recorded. And in that time, I've been collecting a bunch of small techniques and new uh, tricks with the no input mixing board that I thought it would be good to gather into a uh, um, a technique roundup. So what I'm going to do today is uh, talk a little bit about the mixing board and how I have it set up for my sort of standard patch right now and then go into detail about a couple of these different techniques or tricks that I've been finding for the mixing board and each of those will be marked with a chapter in the description to this video. Uh, before we get started though I do want to note that this is a different mixing board than the one that I've been that I was using the last time that I was recording these videos. I still have the 1202, it's doing great, but I upgraded to the 1402, and I say upgrade because I just really like this thing a lot better. It has a few extra channels, and it has these faders instead of knobs at the bottom. And these are just, these really fit for me as a performance interface. Uh, they're much more dynamic, you can coordinate more movements at the same time. And uh, uh, so I love this thing. So before we get into um, the individual techniques, I just want to talk briefly about the patch as it is set up here. Uh, as I talk about this, I'm going to be using uh, all of the sort of language and ideas that I've been developing in the previous explanation videos about the known put mixing board. So uh, uh, if you're confused about anything that I'm saying here, I'd recommend that you go back and look at some of those other videos because those sort of work as a foundation for the ideas that I'm talking about here with regards to things like stable oscillator loops uh, and, and uh, feedback loops and just how I'm coordinating things on the mixing board. So channels one through four over here are all set up as independent sort of oscillators or stable feedback loops using uh, the... Uh, channel inserts on channels one through four. So if we take a listen to these, we can hear. We have a couple of tone generating channels. And I find with the low cut and gauge, these stay pretty stable. And I don't have to retune these a lot. So I really like this as sort of the either tonal or uh, uh, pulse generating side of the mixing board over here with these four channels. Then I have two channels here that are both dedicated to an aux one feedback loop. Uh, and this is going to be using something that I'm talking about, which is a Y cable splitter. Uh, so out of the aux one send here, I'm sending two channels in parallel, which are both going back into aux one. Then there is one channel dedicated to an aux2 feedback loop uh, here. And um, this is sort of like uh, the aux1 feedback loop light. It's just another uh, versatile feedback loop that anything can be sort of poured into. Uh, works really well for me. And then pretty consistently, I've been dedicating one channel to uh, the alternate or mute output to create a, a routing there so that I can route any of the other channels to this alternate output. And um, in conjunction with these level buttons up here on these channels, this creates a really nice boost that can add a lot of um, weight or additional sculpting and distortion to any of the other existing channels. And then that leaves sort of these two sets of flexible channels open on the end. This is great for bringing in an external input uh, to do feedback mixing on an input um, or uh, there are additional routings from the back that could be run into here. I find that it's useful to just have a couple of channels that I can dynamically allocate to whatever I want for a particular patch, but to think of the rest of this as fairly stable so that I can build up some practice and habits with this particular setup on the mixing board. So let's start rounding up some techniques. The first thing that I've been using a lot and really loving is this idea of a mute envelope. 
or using the mute buttons here on each of the channels in order to create very short percussive envelopes for any of the channels. So without using these mute buttons, um, there's a limit to how fast you can open up a channel. And so you always get a bit of a wah on the attack of uh, any note that you're articulating here. So. But with one of these mute channels, I can bring this up silent and then release it and I get this really nice plucky attack on an individual note. And then I still have manual control over the decay of that uh, by bringing it down with my hand. I think that this opens up a lot of new articulations with the mixing board. And I find that there are lots of times where being able to pluck something is a really helpful uh, technique in my toolkit. It's also possible to create more complex timbres with these plucks by routing multiple channels to something like the mute here. So what I'm going to do is run several channels over to bring them up. Over here, I'm engaging this level button here to add some additional distortion. I'm going to bring up the highs on this. And now if I use that same mute technique here, I can take this more complex sound and we can bring in even maybe some higher, more dissonant. Uh, let's see what this sounds like. really nice getting that um, those higher pitches which on a longer note stand out as a distinct pitch but become sort of part of the overall timbre on a plug the next thing that I want to talk about is uh, subharmonics and sort of subharmonic distortion or subharmonic locking with the mixing board I've talked about this a little bit before but I think it's worth demonstrating again as part of this technique roundup here. So the idea is that by running a stable tone into another channel that has its own feedback loop going, you can cause that channel to lock to subharmonics of the tone that you're throwing into the channel. Let me show you what this sounds like here. So I'm going to bring up a tone I'm going to bring up a tone here and now I'm going to run that into the aux 2 feedback loop and what we'll hear is that at first we're just getting the same tone, but then we and actually what I'm going to do is uh, just as a volume control here, I'm going to bring up aux two using the solo fader just to get a little more of it in the mix here. So you can hear that it's locking to this other channel. And as we change the pitch here, uh, you'll see that the, or you'll hear that the 
tone that we're this lower tone that we're getting on the aux 2 feedback loop our subharmonic distortion here is going to shift uh with the upper tone it's not always going to track it in the same relationship um but it's always going to be derived from that other tone There's some really cool stuff with this. Um, I don't know entirely how this works. It's a uh, the science of this sort of subharmonic locking with the distortion um, uh, escapes me, but uh, it's really cool and useful. And uh, I think that there are a lot of additional interesting tones that you can get with this technique. Related to this, um, on the idea of pitch control and tones, uh, something that came up in the other one that you might have seen is that with two channels controlling a feedback loop like this, you actually can get fairly precise pitch control by adjusting the amount of feedback on each of the two channels. So here I'm going to And now I'm going to turn one of these down so that there's less feedback on um, one of these channels. What I'm thinking of is more of my fine tune and increase the feedback on the other channel. So we should expect larger changes on this channel and finer changes on this channel. Although the EQ is going to affect this some as well. And now when I turn this up a bit, you'll see. So with these two parallel channels, depending on how much feedback we put on one compared to the other, we can treat one as more of a coarse tuning and one as more of a fine tuning knob which gives us uh, much more precise pitch control using the two uh, uh, faders together. The next thing that I want to talk about is these Y cables. Um, these are really cool. I talked about this a bit in the overall patch uh, description for the mixing board, but I just wanted to come back and talk about this as a specific technique. So. This is just a splitter cable that is taking a single output and duplicating it to uh, two channels here. And then each of those is running into a channel to create parallel feedback. This makes the uh, sort of fine tuning pitch controls that I just talked about possible. It also allows for more dynamic feedback loops when we create very different EQ, EQ parameters between these two channels. I really like the way that you can get something that's fairly low and pulsy and something that's fairly high and squeaky. And then when you bring them together, you can get very creatureful sounds by using this parallel. Uh, parallel feedback. And so these Y cables are really useful for that. I was listening to an interview with Toshimaru Nakamura, and he was talking about how he makes a lot of three-way uh, cables for himself that he calls W cables. I think even with a two-way cable, this gets very much more dynamic. And I think as you add more parallel feedback systems into the mixing board, you create much more dynamic, unpredictable feedback loops.
The next technique that I want to show here is what I'm calling manual cable disturbance. There's a reason with these four cables here, I've switched three of them out with these nice low profile uh, uh, patch cables here, but I've left one as my uh, old patch cable. And that's because this channel I don't actually use as a stable oscillator much anymore. I'm instead using it as a sort of manual cable disturbance. And so what that sounds like, let me set this up real quick. There we go. And what's going on here is that the cable is not all the way plugged in. Similar to here, it's plugged in sort of to the first click of two clicks. And when I disturb this cable, um, I can get a really nice noise burst with it. And it's a little quiet. Uh, we can control it some with the EQ. And so because it's a little quiet, what I like to do is run this into my mute channel here in order to give it a bit of additional amplification. Helps if I unmute the mute channel. There we go. So you can hear, this is what it sounds like on its own. And then running it through some additional boost. Really nice. And so this creates a sharp start or onset to a sound similar to the way that we pluck things uh, and so this is a great articulation tool as well to be able to create these really nice little swooshes or bursts of sound. It's really interesting uh, and comes from manually disturbing the cable uh, when it's not completely inserted into the jack here. With the low cut engaged, uh, we get a solid tone, a low bassy tone from this. And this is very dependent on the EQ as well. And also is a little bit dependent on what's on the channel next to it. more sounds for the sound palette. Now, additionally, I found that um, if you get this to the point where you can get your noise burst and then you pull it out a little bit more, we can keep it stuck in this noise state. And then it's just a noise channel uh, without any need for additional channels of amplification, except maybe you could say that running it through the mute channel here is that additional amplification, but we're already pretty noisy. We can hear even without, I think I've lost it here for a moment, but there we go. And the EQ really sculpts it into a nice noise source. Um, I don't know what this is going to do to the mixing board. Um, generally, the types of feedback that, um, that happen on the mixing board are fine for the mixing board. Most mixing boards handle their own levels and feedback perfectly fine. Um, but getting into this sort of extended technique and really uh, manip like manipulating the cables and uh, uh, putting them in not quite all the way like this in order to produce noise, I have no idea what this is going to do for the preamp. This is already a fairly noisy channel. I'm not sure that this behavior even works the same across all of the channels. Um, and I think the worst case scenario is that this noisy preamp is going to become noisier, which is exactly what I want it to do in this case. Uh, so hopefully it ages like, like a cheese or something. I'm not quite sure. I'll keep you all updated if I uh, end up messing up this channel at all. But so far it's been working great and it's doing exactly what I want it to be doing, which is making more noise. And that noise, especially in a small footprint like that, can then be fed into other channels to create... Uh, really nice results. So.
I'm going to feed that into box one. Really, really nice noise there. So that's most of the things that I want to show you. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about is just a quick note on my current recording setup for the mixing board. Um, one thing that you might notice is that I've been keeping the main output much lower uh, here than I have in the past. And that's actually because I'm not using any sort of limiter or intermediary device between my mixing board and my audio interface now. By keeping the volume lower and keeping real control over that, um, I'm at a point where I feel very comfortable with the mixing board and running it like a line level instrument, uh, so long as I'm careful with the volume, is working great for me right now. Uh, and I still think that everything that I've talked about with limiting has been useful. It was really, really helpful for me as I was getting started to feel comfortable um, and to have a solid safety net for the mixing board. But I also just want to be transparent right now and say that I'm not limiting my signal as I'm going into the audio interface. I'm also, for the most part right now, recording in mono. Um, I've been finding that uh, a lot of the time the... Using a mono output is exactly what I want for the mixing board. I don't do a lot of stereo manipulation on here, but that's also because I'm mostly going into a, a digital audio workstation where I might want to pan things in post if I'm doing any sort of panning. One thing that's really nice about the 1402 here is that it has separate uh, volume sliders for left and right. Um, I say really nice, but it's actually a bit of a double-edged sword. Uh, this means that to use these dynamically, it's hard to maintain an exact level between the two of them as you're bringing them up and down. So outputting as a stereo source, you're going to get some probably unwanted wiggle between left and right as you're bringing these up and down if you're moving these at all. Uh, what it does mean, though, is that if you're sort of splitting out two different mono mixes, you can pan them left and right, and you can sort of dual track any output from the mixing board into uh, a recording device or into uh, any other setup that you want. You can sort of route your audio two ways. And this is helpful if you're doing more of sort of a pad sound that you could route to the right and then have a more dynamic sort of uh, chaotic sound that's coming out the left side. Or really anytime that you want to get two different signals out of the mixing board, having separate level controls for left and right is a, a neat way to do that. Yeah, this is a, a neat quirk about the 1402. So yeah, this has been a variety of uh, things that I've been sort of figuring out and gathering for the no input mixing board. Um, hopefully some of it is helpful to anyone else who is exploring this as an instrument. And uh, uh, let me know if you have any additional questions. I've really enjoyed figuring this out as an instrument. And I feel like I'm at a place where I'm... Uh, getting quite comfortable with it. If I find new things, I'll add another video to the series. Um, but I think most of what I need to make this an instrument and maybe what you need to make this an instrument similar to the way I approach this has been documented now. Um, if there's anything that I'm missing, let me know and I'll be happy to answer your questions or maybe it'll end up in another video. Thanks for following along and I hope you have a great day.